thank you for joining us here in, in the historic East West Studio One for this discussion called Sounds Like Tomorrow. It's about how we as music makers think about ourselves and our work in time, about our relationship to the past and our attitude toward the future. I want us to talk and think this afternoon about what kind of picture or model we have in our minds when we think about music in time. Do we think of ourselves as part of a continuum or a tradition? Is our job to preserve or to progress? Or to do the first thing by doing the second, maybe? If we believe in progress as far as music goes, what might it be progressing toward? And how do we measure how close we are to it, whatever that is? To help me work through these ideas, I'd like to welcome four people whose work has inspired me to think about these things and then to rethink them, to throw out a lot of old models of, of thought, old ways I had of thinking about music in time and construct brand new ones. Perhaps they've done this for you this weekend at Loop 2, I hope so. First of all, to my left, rapper, music maker, writer, filmmaker and activist, Jessica Hansel, aka Coco Solid. From the self-described forward-thinking Jamaican dance music collective Equinox, Gabsborg and Shanique Marie. <laughs> Who saw their gig last night at the Montalban Theatre? My, my, my feet hurt from dancing and my face hurts from smiling, but I, but I can't stay mad at them. <laughs> and finally, author of Retromania, Rip It Up and Start Again, and Energy Flash, Simon Reynolds. First of all, a little bit about me. Uh, I'm a, a writer, radio producer, and nowadays part of the curation team for Loop, working with a bunch of smart, talented people to put all this together for you, so I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, I'm also a music maker. I've been making electronic music of some description since 1998, when I recorded a tape loop of a bus door opening and closing and played it on the community radio show that I was hosting nonstop for just over an hour. <laughs> uh, this was, this was during the, the radio station's annual sponsorship drive, and I can tell you now that it had the opposite effect of, like, of what, what that drive was all about, in the sense that people threatened to cancel their subscription unless the idiot on the radio stopped making that noise. Um, what, I, what I learned from that was that, uh, that I was a very important composer and most likely ahead of my time. <laughs> That's how my model of, of music in time worked back then. I should say, first of all, before we get into this discussion also, that, that we're, what I don't want to do here is for us to try to anticipate or predict the future because of music or of anything, because I think that's a pretty thankless task. And in fact, Simon asked me specifically for us not to do that, and I, and I know exactly why. I don't want, I don't want anyone here to, uh, I don't want to make anyone here look silly in the actual future, you know? I don't want, I don't want us to be like fodder for ironists of, of 2034. That would be terrible. I want us to talk about how we think about music in time, making music in time. Um, one of the, one of the um, more remarkable things that David Bowie did before he died was to tell Lord, the New Zealand pop singer, that hearing her music was like listening to tomorrow. That's, that's what he said to her, apparently. Um, Coco, if, if David Bowie said this to you, would you take it as a compliment? And if so, why? Um, I think um, tomorrow as an idea is um, interesting mm. in that I think it gets uh, definitely chased and fetishised in this industry. You know, we're always um, looking for the next thing. And I think a, a big part, we, Shnik and I were talking about it earlier, is um, futurism for me. Uh, I think with science fiction, I'm always like thinking about that as a coping mechanism, if you're you know, a Māori and someone. And um, I think science fiction is a really healing thing for indigenous um, 
thinkers because we often go there, you know, and Afrofuturism as well. We often go there as a, what would have happened if we didn't get colonised and, you know, things didn't get fucked up? And we imagine um, a, a place, you know, and so, but even then, I feel like I still am in touch with the rituals and the traditions of my ancestors. And I think um, paying homage to them is a way of keeping our culture alive back home. So I don't necessarily think that our future is um, an escape from the present. I think it's a combination. It's um, my ancestors live in front of me, my descendants live behind me, they walk towards me. Time is a braid, kind of dipping in and out of itself. You know, Deleuzean theory with, like folds back in on itself yes. and we get antagonised by the past and the future, all that stuff. So I'm kind of coming from that angle. Yeah. I don't know what that angle is, but time's not real. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. That's the end. That's Thanks for coming to my TED talk. No. Yeah. So, um, when you say antagonised by the by the future, I was going to ask, and perhaps 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 um, this is a question for the whole group. Uh, have you ever have you ever had the feeling that 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 tradition was you know, we draw, we draw a lot of inspiration and strength from tradition as, as music makers and people who make culture, but have you ever felt that it was oppressive or that there was too much of it? Like, in other words, that you had too, too, much, too much history and that, it, that, it was a, that you felt it to be a burden or you needed to break away from it? Gav, Shanik? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I definitely feel that way, that way sometimes. Um, coming from Jamaica, where we have about six or, or more actually distinctive genres, um, and I think sometimes when you go into the space of the world, it's like, oh, you're a reggae artist or you're a dancehall artist or you're this or you're that. Um, so I think that kind of puts a, a, a burden on, on me at times and, at, and on my peers um, that they have to be limited to this type of situation, even when they like it but would like to do something else. Yeah. Yeah, um, I think I've, I've definitely been a victim, oh, a victim. I've definitely, you know, fallen under that um, bracket. I can tell you for sure uh, that, um, that my producers in the Equinox Collective have definitely, I would want to say, empowered me musically. Because um, as Gavin said, being in Jamaica, you're brought up uh, in a certain way where music is this. And it's, it's, it's just, I, I, I want to go as far as to say one dimensional where everything falls under, in one box. And, and that's generally what our music represents. So even though Jamaican music has influenced so many genres and has gone out into the world and has created a path for so many different um, musical inspiration, when you come from Jamaica, it's like, this is what you're, I'm Jamaican, I sing reggae, or I do dance all, or, you know, so when Gavin and Nick and, and Jordan started making what people have called our music avant-garde and um, futuristic dance hall, when Gavin first brought some of the instrumentals to me, I was like, what is that? <laughs> I, I, I don't know how to sing, I, I don't know what to do with that. You know, and he was like, just trust me, no man. Trust me, this is, you know, this is, this is, this is gonna be great, you can do this. And it kind of, it kind of, as I said before, empowered me and opened my horizon and allowed me to dig deep within to find a lot of creativity that was in there that I was limited to and that I had suppressed because I thought, if I sing that, people are going to be like, what is she singing? So I do, I do agree that it, it, it can be quite burdensome and, and can prevent you from being able to tap into a lot of potential that you have that you may never ever really experience because of that. Yes. 
I, I could say for myself that the first time that idea was really crystallised for me, like that there might be times when you have to shake off the past or the, or the, the weight of tradition, was when I read one of Simon's books at the, at the tender age of 21. I bought a copy of a book called Blissed Out, which is a collection of essays and, and, um, and journalism. And I've never felt... I'd, I'd had, always had the idea in my head that there was, a, there was a history of art and music before me and the idea that it sort of was moving somewhere and might continue to move after after in, in the future, but I'd never felt in such a hurry to get there as like for, it, for things to go faster as I did after, after reading that book. That, that shaped my picture of time to an extraordinary degree. Simon, I'm wondering, what was it, what was it for you? What, 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 what led you to think of, uh, of music and the progress of music in the way that you did when you wrote that book? Um, it, was, it was really just um, growing up reading the British music press and I suppose, uh, um, in rock culture generally, um, there, you know, from the 60s through into the, you know, 60s was an age where people were trying to do everything new in every art form and fashion and everything. It was the great premium on, on the getting rid of tradition, change, acceleration, and then that carried on into the 70s with things like progressive rock and kraut rock, uh, where, you know, the very word progressive, mm. you know, implies ev evolving and moving forward. And then with uh, the post-punk era that I grew up in, um, um, you know, there was a sort of race to get to the, to the 80s first. Actually, that reminded me, I was going to say, um, that David Bowie gave that nice compliment to Lord. He actually said the same thing to the Human League. He said uh, to the Human League, um, their music sounds like 1980. But he actually said it in 1979, so it wasn't such a huge <laughs> compliment, you know, but, you know. It was meant to be very complimentary. Um, but um, yeah, so in, in all that, there's a sort of, even though, even perhaps in the rock culture and, and the music press, not that many people have read all the, you know, uh, necessarily read the futurist manifestos or all this, you know, modernist theory, but they've sort of absorbed this, these sort of ideas that, you know, you should um, keep doing new things. I mean, there's sort of, there's kind of two, uh, I'd say there's two sort of edicts, the modernist edict. Or in some ways, the, um, the, the motor anxiety of the modernist artist is, you know, one, you don't want to repeat what someone else has done before, and two, you don't want to repeat yourself. But if you think about it, that's an extraordinary burden on an artist, isn't it? Yeah. You know, you, you might innovate thing. something that's completely your own, but then you're not even meant to repeat that. You know, you're going to have to come up with another new thing and another new thing. But that gave a tremendous acceleration to music, Culture, and I think you know it, it's not just a property of rock; it's like a property of um, of uh, rhythm and blues and funk and, and uh, cl club music. Generally, is a feeling like um, do something that no one else has done before and keep pushing the music forward. So that, that's sort of in the fibre of my beings. I could never really abandon that, even though. Some would say that's actually an, now an old-fashioned approach to music. You could talk about old-fashioned modernism, which is sort of me, really. It's a, it, it is still a really pervasive mental model, you know, um, to the extent that Jaden Smith in 2016 said about rap music, I think the most important thing in rap or music as a whole is progression and expansion. The most important thing is in rap is to be progressive. You know, this is like, it goes, it's really deep in our conversation and in our, the models of thought that we use, this idea that the progress is important for its own sake. And I think there's plenty of music makers and writers who would agree with Smith to some extent, the idea that music must move forward. But it also occurs to me, and I'd be interested in, in your thoughts on this, that the idea of progress, the whole idea of progress in music as in anything else is a cultural thing. There are plenty of societies at different times and in different parts of the world that got along completely fine without it, you know, that had no real need to kind of peek into the future or to think about time in those terms when it relate, related to culture or anything else. It's, all, it's a surprisingly recent idea and I wonder whether we could benefit from a longer, wider view. You know, like like we we've had this idea of progress in music for what, like like two hundred years or something, at least in 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 the in the Western world or in, in pop Western popular music. Could we expand this this picture of time and and maybe think of, come up with a, a better model? What do you think, Coco? Um, I think it's for me. It's determined a lot on uh, your dynamic with history, your relationship, and like, for me, I'm quite distrustful of historical canons. 
you know, because... Why, why is that? Well, <laughs> I feel that, uh, just as an example, being a Māori person, you know, a lot of our philosophies and um, ideas and creativities are cropped pop culturally out of the picture um, by, you know, and there's a lot of uh, colonial British ideas of um, quality control and respectability and high quality, you know, and um, the, you, you know, you don't want to do that, this is more what, what you people want to do. And so I think if you're brought up in a world where you have, you know, you have to fight to get your ideals um, expressed, and also if you are a wahine, if you are a woman, um, you know what it's like to often be a little bit uh, edited out often, yeah. you know, so <laughs> there's a, for me, there's a pursuit in a, um, of my idea of progress, yeah. which is sometimes uh, return simply to being myself. You know, that to me is apparently a radical act, um, but it's, you know, for me, it's, it's natural. That's, but that's progress to other people. That's progress to um, a historical oppressive canon that um, basically is like so fresh, so new, so funky, it's like, mm, it's kind of old, yeah. you know? And that's kind of a lot of stuff you see in um, cultures that have to actually fight for their voice and their musicianship and their artistry to be validated, especially in the Western world. Yeah. You know, it's like, mm, it's not that fresh, it's just fresh to you. And, and the, it's, it's precisely the canon that creates that, that structure that you're, you're struggling against, right? That, yeah. is how, that is how those ideas are propagated and continue, continue by the construction of this, this list of classic works or this idea mm. of like, yeah. Which is why I always question who created this canon, who curated this canon, who said that this was the actual like music history, yeah. who said that this was, um, you know, the popular material that we are working with, you know, that was all controlled by uh, white men traditionally, so of course there's going to be a slight bias of what comes into view as being popular, what comes into view as being respectable. Yeah. And I feel like if you question it systemically from the bottom up, who was controlling what got to be seen, heard, you know? Are the Beatles really the greatest band that ever lived? <laughs> right. You know? Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, and this, and this is a big, a big thing in post an important idea in post-colonial movements generally, right? Was the the, the construction of, of or the reconstruction of tradition, so that so that hist so that history could move forward in a more progressive direction for the people the people concerned. I wanted I want to return to this to dwell a little bit on this idea of direction right now because we've been talking about progress. And, and as you've said, Coco, there's, there's already a question of like, who's progress and toward what? You know, this is, we, we need to talk about that. Um, thinking, about, thinking about music, thinking about a genre of music that you love, maybe a genre of music that you produce or that you work within, did you, did you ever worry about direction? This is, this, this is um, a question for, for Shanique and Gavin. Did, did you ever have the feeling that the, the genre of music that you were working in had taken a wrong turn and, and if you did, did you have an idea of what a right turn might be? Did you feel this, like, this question about direction, which way to go? Um, well, dancehall, um, I think, has made several turns, coming from like the proverbial 90 to 100 BPM to in the mid 2000s, like 120, 125, um, that started using elements from from soca, from more traditional African sounds. Um, some of it sounded, you know, quite electro-like and stuff. Um, and it was quite, it was quite, um, it was quite refreshing. It was quite good. Um, it sounded to me like a new genre at that time. Um, but it wasn't it wasn't um, titled, you know. So we had this we had this really cool wave of of just like people dancing frantically in the streets for hours and hours and hours, um, which is something shockingly that that doesn't necessarily happen in Jamaica. It's more like, you know, like standing in the corner, you know, relaxing with a beer. 
Um, but in this time, in about the mid 2000s, we had this really cool wave. And then after that, um, which could have been a reflection of society, after that, we had a really dark wave um, of still like 120, 130 plus BPM stuff, but um, with totally different content. Mm -hmm. Um, speaking about, you know, um, stuff that was going on in the country at the time, you know, the stuff with the society, a lot of, a lot of wrong stuff. Um, I, I don't know if I would go as far as to call it a wrong turn, but, um, the, the, where it went before was definitely more refreshing because I think what was happening was just that the music was responded to, responding to what, whatever was happening in the society. Yeah. Um, you know, so like, like, I understand why it happened, but I definitely like what was happening um, before. This, is, this reminds me of a, a concept that, um, that the, the German playwright Bertolt Brecht used to use. He would talk about the question of a mirror or a dynamo. Like, is, is, is culture or is music or theatre for him, is it something that just reflects what is, what is going on in the world or does it push it forward some, somewhere? You know, should, can we be content with uh, music that simply reflects what's going on in, say, Jamaica at a particular time or do we want to like, take responsibility for it and push it somewhere else? Um, <clears throat> I think, just to kind of add to what Gavin was saying. I think with, with music and direction and progress, it's always contextual. It's always, it's always based on the individual who is reviewing what we, what we, what we call progress. I feel like once the music is representing something that is important to someone, it will always be progressive. Because we must understand that music is a weapon that is used in various ways. And I think what, what was happening in Jamaica is that music had become almost like a museum or a gallery where what was happening at the time was being displayed and people were using music and I, I kind of want to bring back what Coco said as a form of of hope so every time every time someone was able to express what was happening in the society at the time it was us acknowledging what was happening and also almost like us putting it on a platform so that a solution can be found. So progress to me, I feel like once music continues, there is always progress. We have to be careful that we don't put a, a construct on what progress is based on what the Western society has deemed progress to be. Progress will always have a unique and intimate meaning based on the individual and how music is perceived to them and what the purpose of that music is. And once we have music and once we have a space where we can express ourselves or appreciate someone else's expression, that to me will always be progress. It's it's a fantastic point you made, Shanik. I, I I agree. I mean, the one one of the things that that strikes me about a, a, a an event like this, you know, a weekend like Loop, where there's a lot of talk about about the future in relation to music. You know, people are like inventing new things, like new processes, new techniques. There's new technology coming along, um, a lot of which we've displayed here and talked about. It's all been been very interesting. People are are looking for, for innovative things like new sounds or new new ways of doing things, something new under the sun. I you know, I I sometimes I like all of that. I find it exciting and interesting, but I also kind of find myself asking sometimes to where, to what, you know, what's, what, what, in other words, I wonder, just as, the, as you, you um, expressed so well, about the relationship between progress in music and progress in society. Like, what is the, what, what is the, the connection between these two things? Is there a connection? Um, Simon, I'd be really interested to hear, to hear your, your thoughts on this. Are these, 
Are these two concepts tied together somehow for you? Like progress in a, in a social or political sense and progress in music? Can we have one without, with, without the other? What do you think? Um, they have been, for me, tied up because uh, of growing up during the post-punk era where you had you know, a lot of musical innovation, but also uh, you know, a lot of new kind of subjects being discussed in, in music, new lyrical approaches, new modes of vocal delivery. Uh, you know, a group like the Slits had never, was new on multiple levels of expression, uh, feminism, uh, representations of how women could behave on stage. Um, and, uh, but also musically, they were doing lots of interesting things. Um, but I, I don't, but gradually uh, over the years, I've come to think that although that does happen and there's a sort of link between a commitment to political change um, and music, and there are plenty of examples, whether it's Public Enemy and hip hop or you know, the whole adventure of the 1960s. There's a lot of times when there's no connection. And in fact, a lot of times, um, uh, the most interesting music to me is linked to things that you'd have to say were either politically regressive or just kind of static. Like for instance, it, like, you know, a lot of the most interesting music sonically uh, in the last four or five years has been trap music. And, and there's often interesting new things being done with the, f the flow, but the actual content um, is, rigidly stuck on the same themes, you know, of, of uh, you know, materialism, um, ice, women as sexual disposables, um, you know, it, it, cooking and selling drugs. And, you know, it's not, it's not, uh, it's not changed, the subject matter has not changed, really. Uh, people might have new and funny and witty ways of talking about those things and interesting new flows, but... Um, it's fundamentally fairly regressive on the political level. You wouldn't say that it was uh, uh, woke or, you know, you might say it's counter-revolutionary in some sense. Um, and the fact that certain rap songs were around that were saying things, you know, that just before the election, uh, Ray Schremer, who I think are a great group, did a song called Up Like Trump, where Trump was like an aspirational figure to them as far as I could see. Uh, you know, that's, that, that shows how the values in, in, in a lot of that hip-hop are related to uh, regressive things in the society. But as music, it's often fantastically inventive. A group like Migos, the things they do with vocals, uh, the flows they've introduced, uh, you know, things that um, Future and Travis Scott and all these people do sonically uh, is, is amazing. But what they're actually... if you what actually you, you get out of their lyrics is a very bleak and depressing view of the world, really, I think. You know, and so you can't see much utopianism in it. Um, so, you know, uh, I'll take the, f the sonic futurism where I can find it. It would be nice if it came with, you know, uh, advanced uh, political consciousness or something, but, you know, uh, uh, that doesn't actually happen that often, I don't think. Um, I think if I could just um, respond to that. Of course. I think that uh, those artists being visible to take on uh, their political voice, which might not be maybe in line with the morality of the Western world of what a progressive politics, you know, I think that in itself is um, not necessarily true. I think the fact that they're able to adopt and subvert and, it, you know, uh, mock and perform values that were uh, superimposed on them. I think, you know, that can on the outside look like it's um, a failure, but I think that that's, uh, um, you know, it's an ex they are free to adopt any kind of uh, political voice on the spectrum of what is seen as uh, capitalistic, um, you know, bad values. You know, I think them doing that, it may, it may seem to be a certain way, but the fact that they are visibly doing that in pop culture, I think, is um, challenging in itself. And the fact that people get to kind of critique it. And, you know, we can't forget that aspiration isn't, especially under a capitalist society, aspiration takes many forms and it's not always pretty. Mm. When... Um 
I've, I've been, been sort of, in the course of putting this event together, the Loop team has been traveling back and forth a little bit from Berlin to Los Angeles. Um, and the first time I came here, we were, we were staying in Pasadena, which is near where, um, where the, the Ableton office is. And one of the first things I did when I got there was to go and see the house that was Marty McFly's house in the movie Back to the Future. <laughs> I couldn't wait, you know. <laughs> it was such a good time. Um, because that, cause, cause that, that movie made a, made a big impression on me and, and my, my idea of what time is like and what it means to live in time and to think about time. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a moment from that film that I'd like us to take a look at now. Um, I'm, going to, I'm going to confuse our friends at the front of house now by playing the second video first, but I hope that's okay. It's called, it's called Johnny Be Good. All right. All right, this is, uh, this is an oldie, but, uh, well, it, it's an oldie where I come from. All right, guys, uh, listen, this is the blues riff and B. Watch me for the changes and try and keep up, okay? <laughs> You guys aren't ready for that yet. But your kids are going to love it. Be being, being ahead of your time is, is not so much fun, right? It's, it can be awkward. <laughs> playing, playing music from the future to people in the present or the past or whatever it is. It's, you know, uh, M Michael J. Fox in that film can console himself because he knows that he's right, that music will progress in the way that he knows that it will. So when he plays them, you know, Jimi Hendrix sounds 10 years too early, he knows that history is on his side. He'll be proven right eventually. You will like this, or your kids will, you know. For most people, it's not, it's not, not so easy, right? We just have to guess what music is, is gonna be like in the future. And sometimes the best guess we have is that whatever is weird, you know, might, might be the future, if it sounds odd, if it makes you uncomfortable in some way. It just makes me think of um, that group Death, the Detroit brothers who um, preempted punk about, you know, 10 years before the Sex Pistols. And um, 
yeah, it just makes me think that a lot of pop culture fantasy in terms of um, acquiring something special, the next big thing, a lot of that fantasy is based on how can I hack time? How can I, uh, you know, be derivative but get away with it? You know, how can I um, reupholster something and um, seem to be, you know, really edgy? It's like a, it's definitely um, a challenge that I think artists, we take on when we're trying to be experimental. I mean, I'm a big fan, not just because I'm, you know, I come from a pretty mixed race family. Um, I've always feel like hybridity always leads to kind of um, new ways of thinking because of the tensions <laughs> that arise, in my family anyway. It's just like, you know, you come to these um, cultural resolutions and these um, agreements that I feel like often can only be born out of those kinds of conflicts and those kinds of, um, those things. So yeah, I was just seeing that video and I just thought it was interesting. I mean, death is a, is a good example. I, 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 yeah, they didn't get credit until like recent years, right, you know, yeah. and, and they... But what does what that, what, and this is a question for everybody really, what, I, I always wonder about this, what does that actually mean to be ahead of your time? Like no one, no one believes that an artist really sees through a crystal ball into the future. What is actually going on there when we, we praise an artist or compliment them as being somehow ahead of their time? Um, I'm going to jump in here. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> work with me on this thought. I know, you know, I don't know if this <laughs> ever happens to people when you have like a ton of thoughts going on in your head and you're like, I'm going to try to throw them out there and hope that it comes into some form of sense. Well, this is one of those right now. So let's work. Let's try to work through it together. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I instantly thought of that movie Kate and Leopold. I don't know if any of you have seen it. I haven't seen this. What, what, what is it? It's a romance oh, yeah. movie. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I haven't watched it in a long time. So let me try to explain it to you. So basically, Leopold was from like the, the Elizabethan era and he got into like a time warp and then he ended up in the future. And he ended up in, in a romance with Kate and blah, 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 Ford, Ford, Ford. And then at the end, she finds, or her friend finds these pictures, I don't remember if she found them or the friend, of, of back in Leopold's time, and she was in there. No. With that said, I'm almost seeing the, the music continuum and just life in general, as a continuum, yes, where it's a mirror image. Where there's no present future without the past. So even if we have music that is weird and uncomfortable, that is ahead of its time, there must have been something that was taken from the past. Yeah. Yeah. It could not exist on its own. Yes. It's just not possible. So therefore, I think we can say that the past is the present, the present is the future, the future is the past, the future is the present, the past is the future. They're all one in the same. So if, if we're going to say with music, we can, you know, will this go into tomorrow or this music sounds like tomorrow, that's because it sounded like something from the past. And all we've done is continue to build on it and it might seem like tomorrow because many of the people of the past, they're gone. So they're not here to hear that music of tomorrow. But if they heard it, they would be like, that sounds a lot like what I was listening to. Yeah. It's funny how this, uh, sorry. Uh, I in, in, Did I that make you. any sense? Yes, a whole bunch. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it is funny how this, this discussion kind of leads us around in circles sometimes, isn't it? But I think it's true. Like, yeah, it like, can be very cir um, circuitous, but I mean, yeah. that's what it is. I mean, I mean, you know, regarding new sounds, like I think, I think the, the, the five of us right now could come up with, with 20 of them in an hour. We could come up with 20 new things that nobody had ever heard of before. But, no, but the question of whether anybody would want them or what they were, what they were for is another thing, right? Like it's, you, I read, I read a, a great book this year 
by Adam Harper, where he spends the first half talking about what he calls music space. That is like the total space of possibilities of what could be done with sound and music, you know, and builds all of these great thought models to, to help us think through what could be possible in that space. And of course, it's infinite, you know, like the, like the number of things that we could do with sound it's, it, goes, it goes on forever. And, you know, being here at Loop, we, we have the, the occasion to think about that and feel it. Um, my, my question then is, if that's true, if music space is potentially inf infinite and there are literally endless permutations of sounds that could, we could, that could be made, are we exploring this music space fully? And, and if not, why not? I think we can explore it as much as we can as individuals and and you know we're bound to whatever we're bound to in that situation, um, you know because everything is connected to our own experiences and whatnot. Um, I personally try to respond to whatever I come across that that inspires me, you know, and and that's just me doing my job of you know with exploring it as as much as I can. Um, just to go back a little to the, the conversation that was happening before, um, there's an artist, Jay Dilla, that did this, that did this, um, that did this, this song called Lightwork, or Lightworks, is it Lightwork, Lightworks? And um, I was totally blown away by it. I was like, wow. And then I realized that he sampled it from, from Raymond Scott, you know, and then I listened to the Raymond Scott, and I was like, but this sounds like dancer. And this is 1950-something, Manhattan Research Project is yeah. the album. 1950-something, yeah. and it sounded a lot like the dancer that was happening in the year 2000-odd. You know, and, that, and that totally blew me away. So I definitely agree with the point of, you know, of the loop, you know. Um, See what he did there? <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Yeah. There's, a, there's a, a book, I, another book I really like called What is History by, by E.H. E. Carr, where he talks about, you know, again, another mental model that, that historians like or that he said that histori historians are fond of, which is the idea of like time as a procession, you know, people like people marching from the, from the past toward the future. And he said that one of the, one of the you know, that might be true, like we, we, might, we might like to think of it like that, but a better model might be to say that this is a, a procession which is not moving in a straight line, but is kind of snaking around. You know, if you, you imagine it kind of turning corners or doubling back on itself, which means that sometimes 1950 might be closer to 1980, and sometimes 1962 might be closer to 2018. It's, it's, not, it's not this kind of straight line moving from one point to another that, that we might sometimes imagine. You know, it, Uncle, it Kurt, yeah, Uncle Jesse on Full House, so he was kind of on some <laughs> rockabilly shit. Yeah. And he was always like, you I know... Never, I never watched Full House. Yeah, he was on some James Dean thing, yeah, but yeah. they're living in, like, 1980 San Francisco. And I was... I kind of think back to like, you know, the 80s and the 90s where there was this really strange adoption of pseudo 1950s aesthetics and I loved it. I was like a kid and it was kind of like this real diluted idea and it's not until you go back and you see what the real shit was that you're like, oh, I kind of like the, my bootleg childhood, you know, version better. And then you kind of, as you get older, you start to see like these gentrifications of time and how we go back and we dilute like um, historical things, which, you know, I'm not a Puritan. I, um, I think that self cannibalizing um, thing, when it's done with, you know, knowledge and respect and humor and weirdness, like, I think it's okay when it's kind of just done as a weird. Thing it's it's a bit stranger, but I I see it throughout my own pop cultural history. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, let's talk before before we um before we end here tonight about dystopia, um because I feel like like you know in a lot of these these in this discussion about the future of music, this might be the elephant in the room. You know, it's it's kind of it's one thing to sit and talk about how we might be making music in the future or what we might be progressing towards as music makers or something like that. I you know I feel like it's also necessary to sort of zoom out 
to the the bigger context of this, which is that the the future at all reports looks quite dark. You know, like there are there, there we are there are some tough times ahead for human beings living on this on this planet. That seems to be the um, what we are what we are learning. Uh, to be honest, for me, it's kind of like like it feels kind of weird sometimes to talk about like progress in music or what we want to do as music makers in in the future without bring like bringing that bringing that thought into there in there as well. Like what, what how we, how are we going to be living? What kind of world are we going to be making this music in? Will we have time to make music if we're you know fighting a war for food or if the the rest of our civilization is collapsing? Or you know is our is our music making going to just change completely as a as a result of that? Um, Simon, if do you think that 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 it's important for music makers, for people who make culture, like whatever it is, whether it's music or art or or, um, or any other kind of thing, to have to have a, an optimistic view of tomorrow? Like, in, in other words, do we need something to look forward to? Do we need to have a a, a sense that our our civilization or our society is going somewhere in a bigger sense to want to? To, to go to the trouble to make music or write songs or? Um, I, th I think music produces what people are, are feeling, I think, and, and you can't really, uh, uh, you can't really expect music to generate, you know, like a forced grin of optimism when there isn't the materials in the culture or what's going on to provide it. I mean, there is a, one of the things about the dystopian thing is there's a dark exhilaration to dystopianism and a lot of the, you know, a lot of futuristic music, uh, whether it's post-punk era and groups like Cabaret Voltaire with their imagery of control and surveillance that inspired them or, um, you know, with uh, a lot of 90s techno or uh, jungle music was all about this sort of, we're going fast into this dark future and, and, and uh, you know, it was, it was uh, I mentioned in the talk I did on Friday, this guy, Mark Ocada Payne, the mover, and his whole thing about 2017, which we've now overshot, but in the early 90s, he didn't Im imagine 2017 as a world of people, you know, developing and exploring their potentialities and, you know, flourishing and all that kind of stuff. For him, it was like a, a, a battle-scarred, ruined uh, environment that he would be, you know, he would, uh, you know, he was trying to paint a picture of a, this dark, apocalyptic world, you know. Uh, and it was, it was exhilarating and thrilling in the same way that dystopian movies that, you know, people love to go and see these movies about the collapse of uh, civilization, giant waves, you know, giant waves inundating New York. And, and uh, it's a sort of edgy thrill to it. You know, the, re the reality, of course, is going to be horrible when we're all fighting over, you know, the rats, you know, to eat and stuff like that. <laughs> It's yeah. not going to be so nice, but uh, as, a, as, a, as a source of inspiration for music, a dark future or a, a mil, you know, apocalyptic future um, has been very inspiring for lots of people. Um, um, I'm going to say, uh, looking at the dismal future, let me just say that I am privileged that music has found me. I do not see myself as a creator of music. I'm going to clarify that. We don't need anything to create music. And I'm not trying to downplay all the machines and the software that are used now to create the wonderful different genres of music that we have. Music is something that has always been around and will always be around. And so I, I remember one day waking up and just having this, this visualization in my head of music and creativity and art and all of that as, as, a, as a cloud or a bubble that, that seeks persons out to manifest it. What we are doing is manifesting what is already in existence. If we look at like, for example, even slavery, music is what they used as a coping mechanism. There were no keyboards, there were no, um, there were no guitars. There. They had themselves and music found them. 
and they manifested music and it became what helped to carry them through. And that went on. And we developed as technology, as we moved towards the, the, the globalization era and technology, that's how we developed machines to, 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 to represent music in different ways. But regardless of if we're fighting over rats, somebody's going to make music about that. Somebody's going to make music about fighting over rats. Mm. Regardless of the climate of what, what we're living in, music will always find us and we will always manifest it because it's innate and it's what we use to not only survive but to, to have persons know what was happening. Yeah. It's, it's a historical missile. I guess it's just, it's a question of whether, again, whether it's the, the mirror or the dynamo, does, will, will, mu will music in the future simply reflect the rat situation or help us, help us move? move People will be boasting that I've got more rats than you. you know, <laughs> it'll be, it'll be, uh, that'll be the, the trap music of the future will be about the traps that you catch. Rat the rats are, yeah. yeah. Rat trap. Yeah. Yeah. I just, um, if I can I got the biggest rats. Thing, of I think um, we need to stop framing music as a frivolity. Like when the world is collapsing, like are we still going to be indulging in that silly little thing? Exactly. You know, music is a powerful source. It has holistic origins that pre, you know, that's how we communicate it, mm -hmm. and it has evolved over time into something that I think is a weapon, a very real weapon. It ends up transmogrifying the way we think, yeah. and so we need to, if if we're going to, you know, talk about if the world collapses, are we still going to be? using our artistry, you know, it's not an indulgence. It's a very real way to uh, communicate new ideas to one another yeah. and heal. On that note, we'll, um, we'll bring this discussion to a close. This has been fascinating. Thank you so much. I've learned, <laughs> I've learned so much from speaking to all of you about this topic. It's, it's again, you know, my, my thoughts have been kind of enlarged and overturned to some degree. I'm very grateful. I hope it's been, it's been as interesting for you all as it has been for me. Please put your hands together for our, our guests. <laughs>